Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy Chalemi. I'm so excited because we're at The Advisor today. And at The Advisor, we're going to be talking to a special guest. And she is not only a special guest, but she is part of our podcast community. She has her own podcast on The Advisor with Stacy Chalemi. And she is, focuses on memoir writing, legacy writing, storytelling. And she is great at this. And she shows you how to do it. She explains the benefits of doing it and how simple it could actually be and how wonderful and refreshing it could be and how it could actually help you mentally and it also is very enjoyable and could help many people around us. So this is Rebecca Vegas, and she is here today to tell you a little about herself and what she does and she's going to talk about memoir writing and legacy writing today. So Rebecca, take it away. Thank you, Stacy. Um Good morning, everyone. I have been writing for the better part of my entire life. We're talking 60 years now. And I got into it because a teacher said that with my imagination, he would see me in books. I didn't write enough books fast enough because um, he was long out of this world before I was ever published. I started with poetry and I started writing nonsense poems. And people wanted me to write more nonsense poems. I did that for about a year and a half. And then I started writing poems about teenage angst, mostly because we had moved to a different school district when I started seventh grade. And I was the square peg trying to fit into the round hole. It didn't work. Um, I spent seven, six years, six years trying to escape. And that, that's all school was to me was get it done and get out of here. I went to college. And in college, they couldn't tell me how to write. Told me I had talent, but didn't know how to help me develop it. And I'm going, wonderful, what do I do next? Because my high school teachers didn't think I was talented enough to ever write a book. Funny, they've read some of my books now. And they like them. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so um, when you're writing legacy, memoir, um, a self-improvement book, they're not as hard as what it sounds. Okay? You're starting with something simple in legacy. You're writing a story for your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. Some little incident in your life that held significance for whatever reason. But it will show your values, your beliefs, and maybe teach a lesson for young children. You're talking 26 to 32 pages. And that includes illustrations. So you're not even writing all of that. And it's simple. You write what you know. You write what happened. I often talk about pushing my brother down the slide and him breaking his leg and the impact that it made on me because someone else took the blame. And I had to have it explained to me at five and a half years old that, no, it was an accident. I had done nothing wrong. I'd done what I was told. I gave him a push down the slide. Now, when I wrote it, it's probably a thousand words. It will be one part 
of my memoir when I get around to writing it. I will take snippets of my life that had some kind of significance. And that's how I will write my memoir. It's not hard. A thousand words is maybe two and a half pages if mm -hmm. you handwrite it. It's about a page and a half if you type it. It's not a lot of words. Right. No one is asking you to sit down and write a hundred thousand words for a book. Mm -hmm. That's not going to do anybody any good because at some point you're going to go, I don't have any more words. <laughs> Most of my novels run 60 to 65,000 words. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not considered someone who writes the big poems. It's not what I do. Right. It's important to share family stories. Those that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, all the generations who know the stories are going to be gone. If they're not written down, you lose the story. It's extremely important. My grandfather wrote a poem in the early 1930s about living in northern Michigan during a snowstorm during the winter. And they lived on a farm and they had a pump outside for water. And he talks about um, not being able to get east to one road or west to the other road mm -hmm. because all the roads are closed. Right. And the pump freezing. And he says, if you don't die from the cracks in the wall, you'll die from the cracks in the floor. Now, the farmhouse wasn't that bad. Right. But writers embellish, and that's what he did. I was a freshman in college when I had my dad recite the poem, and I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And I put it away. My dad recited this poem to us the first snowfall every winter. I grew up hearing it. And I know most of the words, not all of them. When I did my third edition of my poetry book, which came out in November, I didn't get them till December. Right. I put Grandpa's poem in the back. I sent one to a cousin who's 90 years old. I don't know if she even knew about that poem. I sent one to my aunt, my dad's sister, who thanked me. She couldn't remember all the words. She turned 89 this year, or she will this month. Um, it's important. It's important. She couldn't share it with her kids because she couldn't remember the words. Right. And it was something that was written before she was born. It really seems like, you know, when it comes to memoir writing and legacy writing, it really goes back into the history, keeping that history alive. And if yes. you keep that history alive, you really, it's good for, for self-development. So, because you want to know who you are, everybody wants to know where they came from, who they are. You know, I know for me, there were a lot of gaps, you know, a lot of things in my family legacy that I didn't know about, but wanted to, but, you know, um, they didn't really keep the stories going. 
you know, and I would hear bits and pieces from this person or that person in the family, but I felt like I was missing something because I really wanted to know my legacy. I really wanted to know my history and who I was as a person. I think everybody really, you know, a, a good portion of people want to know where they came from, you know, who was involved, you know, how, how they got to being where they are today and the history that, you know, evolved from it, because it's very interesting, you know, to know what happened a hundred years ago, you know, you know, uh, 200 years ago, where your family was actually originated. These are all things, you know, I think that are important because you understand who you are and why you are the person you are today. Exactly. And it's like, on one part of my father's family, I can go back to King James of Scotland mm -hmm. and that um, there were four brothers. They were Hendersons. They became barons um, under the king. Three of them were his bodyguards. Mm -hmm. One of them was a scribe who was one of 50 or 75. I can't remember how many who wrote the King James version of the Bible. Right. And I had a, a 30 something second cousin, third cousin, I'm not sure which he is now, but on that side of the family who said to someone who posted something on his Facebook, I keep looking for a reason to go to Scotland. And I wrote, you don't need a reason. I said, you're the grandson of kings. Yeah. William the Bruce was a king of Scotland. Right. Who is a grandfather somewhere along the line there. Right. It's like, then there are the Henderson barons that are in there. Um, you don't need an excuse. Dude, you're a prince. You just don't know it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And he said, how did I get to be this old and not know this stuff? I said, well, don't be too surprised to find out that there are also five presidents in your family history. And he said, no way. I said, well, you have a great, great something removed grandfather whose name was John Adams. Yeah. Yeah. And John Quincy was your uncle. There's two right there. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd have to look up the other three, but I know there are three more. Right. And he said, we're going to sit down and I'm going to pick your brain. Because he didn't know this. Yeah. Yeah. Here he is trying to think up all kinds of reasons why he would go to Scotland mm -hmm. when that's where his ancestors are from. Right. At least on one side of his family. Yeah. You know, on his mother's side, on her father's side. So, yeah, he's like, we need to get together. <laughs> I'm going, okay. Okay. I'll let you know the next time I'm going to be in Michigan. We'll we'll find a time to get together. Um, but it's like no one has told him. Right. No one knows the stories. I only know because when I retired, this kid's uncle handed me a file folder and said, now that you have nothing to do, it's time to do the family genealogy yeah and in doing the genealogy on ancestry i came across pictures of my great grandmother's headstone wow and i sent a message to this person because i didn't know richard brown from anybody yeah and said we have to be related somehow because you have my great grandmother's tombstone on your genealogy photos. Right. 
And I got back this delightful letter or email that said, you must be one of Aunt Velma's grandchildren. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm Kathy Papanaw Brown. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, I know who she is. Only I don't know who she is. But I know where she belongs on my family tree. Mm -hmm. Her mother was my grandmother's older sister. Wow. And I knew her mother. But I don't remember in my lifetime ever meeting Kathy. Yeah. Kathy, who is named Catherine May, after her grandmother, my great-grandmother. Wow. And so, you know, it's like I have live relatives I don't even know. Mm -hmm. And it's been amazing. And I got a hold of her and I said, Kathy, who is Uncle Ern's youngest daughter? Because I know he moved to Kentucky. Right. Oh, that's Jackie. She's on Facebook. Get a hold of her. Here's her name. Jackie lives 30 minutes from me. Wow. 30 minutes north of me. That's crazy. She has always lived in this area. I did not know this. Wow. Um, I knew her name was Jackie. I didn't know anything else about her. She is my youngest sister's age. So she's about eight years younger than I am. And we've actually met. Wow. Not under the best of circumstances because we met at her mom's funeral. And it's like I had never met her mom. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. So it was kind of sad because I would have liked to have met her mom. Right. But with COVID and everything and her mom being in a nursing home, that was not possible. Right. And and she just died of old age. She didn't have COVID or anything. But it was nice to meet Jackie and her boys and her husband. Um, and when they were getting ready to start the funeral, I said, I'll move back because this is for family. She looked at me and said, you are family. Stay right here. Mm. So, you know, you never know who or what you might find when you're doing family history. Exactly. So would you say that the first steps, if you wanted to go into memoir writing or legacy writing, what would be the first steps? Like step one, how do you get started? Um, I think the best way to start is to think of the family stories you've been told. Mm -hmm. Things that happen before you were born. Right. Things that maybe your grandparents told you. Right. Or that your parents told you. Or things that you just remember hearing. Yeah. Write them down. Right. Ask others of your age group. Right. If they remember anything about them. Right. Write down what they remember too. Yeah. Until you have the whole story. Right. And then write it as a story. Like I said, it doesn't have to be more than a thousand words. Yeah. Yeah. You have chapter one. Do you do you think for the start of chapter one? Right. It's that easy. If you're doing this for personal growth, what is the challenge you're facing? Mm -hmm. How did you overcome it? If you're still working on it. What led up to where you are at this point? And how do you see yourself going forward? I read an article about a young couple that got married. And when they got married between them, they weighed 700 pounds. 
And she got to thinking, I'm not going to be able to have kids because my weight's going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And at first he did not support her on this journey. Right. Um, he did. He just didn't put in as much effort. Yeah. Until he saw her working out every day, eating no more fried foods, no more takeout, no more um, Instacart or Grubhub or DoorDash deliveries. Yeah. And... She started losing weight. And he decided, I better do something here. Right. And he started doing it with her. She said her biggest challenge was going to the gym, knowing how heavy she was, and feeling like everybody was watching her to see if she would fail. Right. And she's lost... 300 and some pounds. Mm -hmm. He's lost. And they're actually thinking now of starting a family. Wow. Because they're both eating healthy. They're exercising. Mm -hmm. And it's become a habit. It's no longer, I have to lose weight. This is, I want to stay. Yeah. Where at mm -hmm. and if she loses a little more weight fine same with him right but they they look totally different you know the round pudgy face yeah the heavy body the big clothes that hide everything mm -hmm. she's wearing tank tops she's got nothing to hide Wow, that's amazing. And it is, it is. And she's still working out. They, they've they made exercising fun. They walk the dog, which is something they really didn't do. They just let it out in the yard. Yeah. And now they spend evenings talking and walking the dog. And they're meeting all kinds of new people who are out walking dogs. Yeah. Um, their social life that had been confined to being couch potatoes. Mm -hmm. has blossomed. Right. They do go out to eat, but they look at the healthy choices on the menu. Right. They don't eat out all the time. Mm -hmm. Um. It's it's a uh, celebration when they do. Right. I mean, they both get dressed up. It's an occasion. Mm -hmm. It's not just jeans and a t-shirt. Right. And they do look at what's healthy. Yeah. And they do look at portion size. And if it's a big portion, they only eat half and take the rest home. Right. So write about this because there's somebody out there who's struggling the same way you are. Mm -hmm. You may never meet them. Right. But there's somebody out there that your words are going to have an impact on. So true. My website tells you that I help writers enhance their skills to create influence, impact, and income. Because the influence and the impact are the two most important things. Yes. Income becomes secondary. Very true. But there is no reason you can't do this. If you have been through trauma, how in the world did you get through it? Yeah. And what do you do when something triggers it? Mm -hmm. Somebody said that they were suffering. They'd been diagnosed as having PTSD and they thought that only had to do with war veterans. Right. And that is not true. If you have been in a car accident, 
You can have PTSD from that. Yes. And if you have event. witnessed something traumatic, you can have PTSD from that. Mm -hmm. And you can have PTSD without knowing it. And you'll think you're going crazy. You aren't. There are people out there who are suffering similar things. Yes. And you writing your journey will help them. And if you're talking a word count, don't worry about anything after 30,000. Mm -hmm. If you get to 30,000, you've written a book. Right. I mean, I used to gauge mine on National Novel Writing Month that starts at midnight on November 1st and ends at midnight on November 30th. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to kamikaze write. All you do is write. You don't correct. You don't edit. You don't anything. You just write. Right. And write 50,000 words because they figure that's a 175 page book. And my first book was written in 21 days and I don't recommend it. <laughs> 21 days because I didn't start until eight days in. Mm -hmm. And then I got home one night to no electricity. So there was no writing done. Right. But I wrote through Thanksgiving weekend and my granddaughter was first grade kindergarten, first grade, second grade, right in there. Right. And wanted to know how many words she needed in her story. And I told her it didn't matter that she needed a beginning, mm -hmm. a middle, and an end. And when she got to the end, that's how many words she needed. Right. Exactly. Because she wanted to write stories like I did. Mm-hmm. And she knew I was shooting for 50,000 words. I said, you don't need to write that many. Right. You just need a beginning. Where does it start? What's happening? Right. You need a middle. Mm -hmm. You're telling me what's happening until you get to the end. And when you get to the end, you're done. Doesn't right. matter how many words you wrote. Exactly. A hundred percent. And it doesn't matter with memoirs. Um, self-improvement, legacy writing. Like I said, my memoir is going to be written in a thousand word clips, little tiny things that impacted my life in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not rocket science. Right. And you don't have to try to write like someone else. Mm -hmm. just be yourself right right like you're you're telling your grandkids this story how mm -hmm. would you tell them exactly it's not going to be perfect i have yet to read a novel that is perfect mm -hmm. the errors might be minimal mm -hmm. they're might only be one or two. Right. But I have never read a novel that every word is perfect. Right. And believe me, I read two to three novels a week. Mm -hmm. That doesn't count what I'm writing or what I might be editing for someone else. Right. Or reading through to give them feedback. Mm-hmm. I do all that in addition to reading yeah. two to three novels a week. Right. So it can be done. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, like I said, it's not rocket science. Right. You don't need a degree to do it. Mm -hmm. You need the desire. Exactly. A hundred percent. That's all it takes. Yeah, that's all it takes. And if you think about it, 
32 page little story for your grandkids. If you think about putting illustrations in, is probably a 16 page story. Mm -hmm. And there'll be tiny little paragraphs. They aren't going to be a whole page. Right. There'll be two or three sentences on those 16 pages. Right. The other 16 will be illustrations mm -hmm. that go with those. Right. Again, not rocket science. Right. Exactly. I think that's amazing. Um, now, you have several books. Can you tell us about the books that you've written? Um, I have somewhere around 18. Mm -hmm. I started out with poetry. And it's in its third edition. It's called Only a Start and Beyond. And if you want to see the the difference between a 16-year-old and I was in my 50s when it ended, mm -hmm. um, there are a couple poems after that. And then my grandfather's, you know, if you want to see the difference between 16 and say 59 yeah it's there it's all right there mm -hmm. i wrote a self-help book called so you think you want to be a mommy for teens and tweens because the last thing you want to do is leave eighth grade go to high school find a boy and get pregnant mm -hmm. because he might not be interested right and a baby is for life mm-hmm then I wrote Secrets, my first novel, which is a mystery. Nice. Small town mystery. Then I wrote Out of the Flames um, because somebody online said, take the word clock, fire, and certain and use them in your first sentence. And give me 750 words and I'll I'll evaluate it. And the guy says, oh, you need to sign up for my $799 class because I can teach you how to write. And I'm going, three books. <laughs> I have three books. What are you going to teach me that I have not learned in these three books? Right. And I wrote Out of the Flames, um, which is, I knew nothing about arson when I wrote it. I borrowed a textbook, a notebook, and personal notes mm -hmm. from a friend who was had just finished an arson course. And she showed me a link online. And gee, it was the link I'd already found. Mm -hmm. And between the link, the notebooks, and the book, I spent three months reading and learning everything I could find out about arson. And then I wrote my book. Wow. Then came Target of Vengeance, which had to do with stalking. Mm -hmm. Personal experience in stalking. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter was stalked. Wow. And so that one I, I could write about very well. Didn't need to research it. Yeah. Um, everybody kept asking me for sequels. These were all meant to stand alone on their own. Mm -hmm. One of them even had an epilogue in the back. So that would tell you that the story's over, right? Right. And everybody kept asking me for sequels. So I decided I was going to write a series. And I hit up my daughter and my granddaughter for names for this detective. Mm -hmm. And we finally came up with a first name of Macy. And Macy, why? I'm trying to figure out what last name will go with it. Right. And I text my daughter and say, what if I use McVannell? She says, Mom, that's perfect. McVannell was my mother's mother's 
maiden name. Oh, wow. I did not tell mom I was doing this. Mm -hmm. I also didn't give it to her to proofread. First out of my books, I didn't give to her. I gave her the book when it came out. And I left it with her. And I walked in the door of the house the next time I was in the area. And she said, don't you think you should have asked? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, no. <laughs> I'm one quarter McVannell. And I said, I didn't make her the villain. Right. I made her the main character. And I'm writing a series. First two books in the series were written in first person. Wow. If you don't think that was tough. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote River's Edge and I wrote Crossing the Line. Mm -hmm. River's Edge introduced the characters and it was a cold case murder that they solved. Wow. Crossing the Line was about bullying. Mm -hmm. And it was high school kids who were doing things that were actually illegal. Mm. It wasn't really a mystery, but it needed to be talked about. Right. At that time, a lot of kids in my community were committing suicide in high school. Wow. And it just wasn't right. And nobody was talking about it. Yeah. Then I wrote Sanctuary, which had to do with spousal abuse and getting out of the situation right because no one talks about spousal abuse either mm -hmm. and how to help women who are being abused yes there was a spinoff a short story spinoff called escape mm -hmm. it has to do with four kids and their mother died, and dad's been abusing the oldest girl since she was eight. Mm -hmm. He beats the two boys, and the youngest girl is seven. Wow. And the oldest girl finally asks for help because she doesn't want her little sister to go through this. Right. And so... The kids are taken from dad. Mm -hmm. um, dad was thrown in jail for something else. And then this got tacked onto it. And the children were actually adopted together. Wow. At the end. So there was a, a fairly happy ending for them. Um, I also wrote as a spinoff of Moonbeams and Fairies. Collected Tales by yours truly. Mm -hmm. They are poems, short stories, flash fiction that all have to do with a little bit of magic. <laughs> and the reason I wrote that is in Sanctuary. They were reading from that book to the kids at right. bedtime. Mm -hmm. And I knew if I didn't write it, my fans would say, where's the book? Right. It is my number one best-selling book. It took me international. Wow. It was the first one to cross international. Mm -hmm. And it still sells that way. Wow. Um, I finally wrote, oh, I wrote, I took a class with James Patterson, mm -hmm. an online class. Um, I am not someone who outlines I am what they call a panster. I sit down and I write from the seat of my pants. <laughs> um, but in this one, I outlined for him. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my outline, I had 130 some chapters. And I'm going, 
I've never written 130 some chapters in my life. Yeah. When I started actually filling out the chapters, I found out I could combine them. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with about 35 chapters, which was more reasonable. Right. And the book is called Rescue Mountain. It deals with PTSD, mm -hmm. narcissism, mm -hmm. obsession, mm -hmm. and kidnapping. Wow. So I rolled them all into one. <laughs> when my dad read it, he said, I think this is the best book you've ever written. Oh, wow. And he read all my books. Um, after that, I wrote G is for Gymnastics, which is an alphabet book. Mm -hmm. That was 18 years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and it's 26 pages. Right. I mean, there are only 26 letters in the alphabet, guys. <laughs> Not like I was inventing more. Mm. And it all has to do with um, women's gymnastics, girls' gymnastics. Oh, nice. So um, from there, I wrote Santa is for Real. Mm -hmm. And it's a story of two 12-year-old boys who learn that sometimes just giving Mm -hmm. is more important than who gives. Yeah. And they built a wheelchair ramp for another student in the school so he could come home for Christmas. Oh, that's nice. So um, there's that one. I wrote the fourth in the Macy series called Something Borrowed, Something Blue. Mm -hmm. And there were two characters, two different characters right, in the book that were getting married. I needed to get them married off before I could do anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed to kind of put an end to the series for right now. Yeah. There were too many other things I wanted to write. Right. I have to go back and write Macy's Wedding. Mm -hmm. I will do that. It'll be a novel. We'll add it as book five, you mm -hmm. know, when we get there. But it's a couple of years yet down the road. Right. Um, I wrote Damsel's Distressed, mm -hmm. which is a short story book, all featuring female leads. Right. And all in different types of distress. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some flash fiction in there. Um, there are a couple of short stories in there. Right. So it's just something I had all of these things and put them together. That's awesome. Um, three of them were just eBooks mm -hmm. and people kept asking me, when are you going to put them in print? And I'm going, right. they're only 5,000 words, guys. They're not printable. Yeah. It's, there's not enough meat in them. So right, right. I put them at the back of this book. Um, nice. And now they are all in print. I like that. Then um, something came after that. Oh, my writing book. Let's write fiction. Yeah. Oh, I like so that. That one came. Um, it's Let's Write Fiction, Tears, Fears, Confidence book. Mm-hmm. And the idea is it may take you six months to a year mm -hmm. to write your first book. But if you follow the steps in this book, you can do it. Right. And there are excerpts from some of my books. There are um, flash fiction pieces that this is the first place they've ever been printed. Nice. So um, that I know... In Santa is for Real, there's a second book at the end called Finding Ghosts. Mm -hmm. Because I first wrote about the two boys in the book yeah. in a flash fiction piece. Mm -hmm. And I put that at the back so that you would have that and have both of them together. I like that. And I'm currently working on two books. One is a thriller. Mm-hmm. And it will be titled Chaos. And the other one is a middle grades historical fiction 
called the standard bearer. That is the 10, 12 year old boy um, who goes into battle during the civil war. Yeah. And his sole job is to stand there holding the regimental flag. Nice. And what we all think of as the Confederate flag is from a Tennessee regiment. It is not the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is the stars and bars. And the background is blue. And it does have some red and white stripes. Mm -hmm. And then it has stars. And I've seen it in person. Um, it hangs all over the government buildings in the South. Mm. And the first place I actually saw it was in um, Charleston. But I know it also hangs in Savannah. I've seen it there. Right. So in the major cities, the stars and bars still hang. Mm -hmm. So taking down all those um, Union Jack type flags. Yeah. That was a Tennessee regiment. Mm -hmm. That had nothing to do with the entire Confederacy. Right. And that's something people think, well, that's the Confederate flag. No, it's not. Now, tell me some of the services that you have on your website that you offer to people. I offer a legacy writing um, workshop. It's two hours, and then I have set aside an hour or follow up mm -hmm. like a couple weeks later yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to give people a chance to write it. Mm -hmm. um, it is $103 mm -hmm. because Kentucky says I have to charge sales tax, <laughs> which is crazy, but they do. So I did. I offer, a, a gr it's called a grandparent's journey. Mm-hmm. But it's if you start your legacy writing and you want a little more. Okay. And this will take you through how to get that little more. Nice. It's a four-month class mm -hmm. after the initial um, two-hour. Then it's a four-month class. And we would meet, you know, two or three times a month. Nice. It's not just uh, Zoom every week. Right. Although, if I were doing a Zoom, I would make sure that there was a Zoom every week, but I would like to meet more often than, you know, just once a week. Yeah. Um, and if people had questions, they would have access to me. They could set up a private Zoom. Right. Um, that's not a problem. I do that. That one's more expensive. And don't ask me how much because I can't remember off the top of my head. But we can go to your website. What's your website it's address? On the website, it's my name, RebeccaVigas.com. And that will get you there. Um, the next one is characters, writing really good characters mm -hmm. so that they are memorable and so that they leave a mark. Yes. When you're done reading it. Is something you would want to go back and read again. Even mm -hmm. if the character is only your grandfather or great-grandfather, you need to write that. Mm -hmm. I mean, my great-grandmother on my dad's side, um, his dad's mother, was the family matriarch. Wow. And if you didn't think so with her four foot 11, <laughs> you're crazy because she ruled. <laughs> Like, do you have any other classes that you offer or any others? I'm working on a, a mastering your manuscript class mm -hmm. <laughs> so that if you really want to write a novel mm -hmm. um, or you really want to finish a full memoir yeah, or a, a book on... Um, Self-improvement. Mm -hmm. I have a class for that. Great. And I'm working on a certification class. If you would like to use my things 
and become a writing coach, that one's on the high end mm -hmm. because you would be a lot of times sitting in on some of my Zooms to see what they're like, not as a student, but as somebody who's giving instruction. Do you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, It's called You, Me, and Your Book. I like that. And, and they can go on your website and they can sign up for that and get all the information. Um, That one's not on there yet. It's in my um virtual office mm -hmm. at your global village. If you go there and you want to sign up for that one, that one's there. Okay. Um, I have a couple different classes in there. Um, I'm working on one. I have been asked to teach my book. And so I'm working on that one. Nice. Very nice. Now, so, if you, you had to give away before we leave, if you had to emphasize on a couple of takeaways, what would you like to emphasize from the, all the things we discussed today to help our, 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 our listeners learn from you? What are some important factors? Okay. Passing on family history is, is a key. You really need to do that. Um, I'm sitting here with a box of tin types pictures that were made on tin. Yep. I don't know who these people are. Anybody that I could ask is not with us anymore. Right. I'm going to a historical society and asking if they have any octogenarians that might know. Mm -hmm. And they may not. But if we can identify them, I will leave them there. Right. And that's where part of my legacy will be. The other part to that is I have a quilt of the ladies of that county back in the 1940s. Yeah. I will leave the quilt there. That's where my mother wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. So, it's so that's where it will go. So it um, seems like... Um, Legacy writing and memoir writing, from what you're saying, it not only leaves, a, um, it not only puts a footprint and and leaves a legacy, so everybody will understand where they came from in your family, but it also can help with self improvement and also can help yes. with going through things in life. Self improvement, um, if you've gone through trauma, there's somebody out there who needs you to write it. They need you to say, you can do this. Give them hope. That's what they need. Give them hope. And, you know, just write in snippets. Mm -hmm. You can embellish later. Right. But get the snippet down. Because that's important. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I think that's really great advice because I think people sometimes get overwhelmed, but they don't have to do everything in, 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 in vast quantity. They could just start with little snippets and then, you know, if they want to expand, they can work their way up later on. I think that's exactly. great advice. Exactly. You, you know, your snippet can be 500 words. It doesn't have to be a thousand. Right. As long as you get the snippet there, because as you ask around other family members your age, they may know something you don't that you can add to it. Right. So by all means, ask. I like that. Get the stories down. And maybe even go to Ancestry.com and, and find out some information there, too. Yes, by all means. Do your tree. If you're going to do family stories, Ancestry is a great place. I I've it. found a lot of them. That's great. I love it. I love it. This has been amazing, Rebecca. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. I love all the podcasts that you've done so far. You're amazing. You've given such a wealth of information and you've helped 
you know, people so much with understanding the importance of legacy memoir writing, um, doing uh, storytelling and all that, you know, everybody, all of that is on her, her, her podcast here at the advisor. You can go to it, you could listen to it. And in her um, description box, she'll have her contact information. If you have any questions, um, Rebecca is more than happy to answer any questions. And thank you so much, you know, for today. You've been a, a, a wealth of information. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Bye now.